For those who haven't met me yet, I'm, I'm Pearson. I'm a, a student here at the GI. I work for FPS. Uh, you know, I've been around if you haven't seen me before. Hello. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about my thoughts about storytelling in first person shooter games. And um, before I get going in earnest, I just want to recognize that this is kind of the summation of a few different strands of thought that I've been uh, working with for the last little while. Um, and the idea for this talk actually comes from an FPS podcast that we held a little while ago about storytelling systems in first-person uh, shooter games. So if you've, if you've heard that or participated, I don't think, uh, so if you've heard it, uh, you'll be hearing a little bit of the same stuff here, but I'm actually flushing it out with theory this time. So hopefully it'll be uh, something that you haven't seen just yet. So um, this talk is a response uh, largely to a couple of things that I've run into over my time in game studies that have tried to conceptualize how we tell stories and why we tell stories um, in, in games, how we socialize, basically, in games. Um, this is just it, Overwatch, you know, watch the pretty pictures if you'd like to. Um, the first is this book over here, First Person War Stories from Game Space, um, that conceptualizes the way we tell stories and why we tell stories about the way we play in games as just being an extension of the valorization of militarism in, in media writ large, and sure, yes, games do valorize um, uh, military narratives, but uh, I don't think that's a fully convincing explanation. Um, and the other, uh, the other person I'm responding to in, in, in big part to the, uh, with this talk is, uh, is Richard Bartle. Um, many people have probably run across his typology of players before that more or less breaks down into achievers, explorers, socializers, and uh, killers. Um, and uh, even though it's not used too much in contemporary game studies, it did hold a lot of sway and inspired a whole bunch of studies that, uh, that were uh, burgeoning in about you know, the mid-early 2000s. Um, and uh, nobody's really come along to, to challenge the, the place of socialization that he, that he, uh, he gave. Um, the way he does this is he basically lines out three modes of play that involve playing the game and defines them as such and then defines this this fourth one socialization as being something people use games for but intrinsically is not related to play if you're playing a game you're playing it and if you're socializing you're not playing the game you're using it as a venue for socialization the two acts are are conceptually distinct and several um, and I think that's I think that's a problem um, and the main reason why I think that's the case is that uh, we are very prone to tell stories about the way we play with the way we play. And we've been doing it basically since we've been able to. Um, and so to demonstrate this, I'm just gonna take you through a brief history of how storytelling in first person shooter games has kind of co-evolved with social media that's enabled it. Um, and so uh, riffing off of uh, Henry Lowood who wrote about the origins of Machinima. Can you see this okay? Is this like, is it Okay-ish. Um, these are some gifts of, of, uh, of Doom and Quake, two uh, very foundational shooters uh, that came out in the in the early days of online play. Um, and uh, they were one of the first, uh, these two together were two of the first games that people began to share replays of their play with. So the online deathmatch was uh, first appeared in, in, uh, in Doom and Quake. Um, uh, and it was possible to record a session of play online playing against other people in something a poorly named WAD file, that's what it's called, a .wad file, um, that contained a series of instructions for the game that basically allowed you to download one of these WAD files and, and see how other people had played the game from their perspective. It was a series of instructions so the game would recreate in-game what people saw. And this was a thing that, be, that began to engender communities where people would share these files. Um, to learn how other people were playing the game, and especially uh, professional players or players that were at a very high level. Um, uh, so players that weren't quite at the same level would use this as a way to improve their skills or learn new tips, tips and tricks, or just to look at cool things involving the game that they were, that they were really interested in. Um, and at the time, this was perfect, because uh, obviously the internet in 1996 wasn't exactly the fastest thing. This was still the area of, uh, of slow connection speeds and dial-up. Um, and the WAD files were very, very light on bandwidth. They didn't contain any audiovisual material, so they were able to be shared in, in dedicated listservs and IRC chats uh, with, with ease. Um, the next stop on uh, storytelling in games, uh, you probably recognize this, this is uh, Team Fortress 2, and specifically the, uh, the death screen that plays when you get fragged by somebody else. Um, and I see this as, as one of the major next steps in the evolution of, of storytelling in games, systems of storytelling that are, that are actually built into the game. Um, and at the time that Team Fortress 2 came out, YouTube was still in its nascent phase. Uh, it couldn't even handle video that was uh, 480p at the time. Um, and the way this kill cam worked is that whenever anybody would kill you in this game as you're running around, you would get killed, the camera would zoom in on the player that killed you and freeze frame for a little bit with you know, a dramatic sound effect. 
um, and let you know exactly who you were killed by and which pieces of yourself had uh, you know, been strewn about the battlefield, including spleen, spleens, livers, arms, things like that. Um, it was a humorous way of indicating what you'd done wrong, who had done the deed to you, um, and also uh, emphasizing the specificities about the things that they were wearing, because in Team Fortress 2 you could wear different hats, different costumes, you could adorn yourself with all sorts of absurd uh, costumes, and um, this was a way of kind of highlighting uh, those elements to people that uh, might not otherwise see it in the chaos of battle. And this was perfectly suited to a time when video was still uh, not the easiest to share online, and it was better suited to the, the image boards and forums um, that Team Fortress 2 communities really cohered around in the early days of the game. Um, the penultimate stop that I wanted to mention is the advent of the Call of Duty uh, Last Kill Cam, which uh, this, this is one of the more recent Call of Duty games, but the Kill Cam, cam was first noted in uh, 2009. Um, and it basically just replays the last kill of the game, the thing that ended the game, the, you know. It was a way of trying to increase the dramatism and tell a story about, about the person who did it all, who ended the whole thing. Um, and it was also, I think, it, it, it came at a time when YouTube was coming into its own as a, as a platform for, uh, for sharing their stories. And so the, the trope, almost the meme now, of, of people posting videos of, of the things, their exploits on, uh, on Call of Duty, um, I think comes very much in lockstep with, with these systems that were put in to emphasize certain important moments in, in the gameplay of these games. Um, and then the final one, which you were probably anticipating, uh, Overwatch's play of the game. And this is the, the one that I'm going to be focusing on the most. Um, the play of the game is a thing in Overwatch that happens after the game is over. And unlike the last kill of the game, which is strictly determined by play rules, like in the case of Call of Duty, the play of the game is algorithmically determined based on what the most dramatic moment is in the calculus of the game itself. So it has a point scoring system for things that have occurred, things that it considers dramatic, and then it replays to everybody, one person's perspective in a group of 12, um, showing the thing, the moment of play that the game has considered to be the most, the most turning point, the most dramatic, the biggest um, impact on the overall flow of the game. Um, so that was a picture of a, of a Bastion robot uh, shooting down somebody else's powerful alt ability and then getting shot down uh, themselves, um, but not before basically securing the victory for them. So this is... Um, I, I see this as, as a format that is, is ideal for the, the modern media environment um, because it consists of 12 seconds of rapid fire algorithmically determined game highlight primed and ready to be uploaded to things like uh, Twitter, GiphyCat, Reddit, um, Imager, uh, you name it, the list goes on. As opposed to these, these curated kill cam videos that people would put up uh, for Call of Duty 2, the, the Overwatch play of the game is disposable. It's a thing that's better put into a 12 second clip into all these services that are, that are designed to, to highlight very, very small portions of video and then disappear from, from view rapidly afterwards. Um, uh, and it's risen to prominence as, as kind of a trope in its own right in, uh, since the release of the game in, in late 2005, I think. Um, so this inclusion of this game feature, I think, uh, could be quite rightly seen as a cynical attempt on the behalf of the developers of Overwatch to tap into this, this vast potential for, for basically free advertising. There's dramatic moments of their game being flooded all over the internet at this point in time. And, and they do, by the very nature of, of the algorithmic determination, tend to be fairly flashy and, and appealing. And um, I think uh, it's tough to argue that they, they didn't see some benefit in uh, in enabling players to do this with, uh, with alacrity. Um, but I don't think that that fully encompasses why this is important as a, as a media object for, for game scholars. Um, and I think that it, it comes down to the fact that this is a kind of the last stop in a long lineage of storytelling that, that players have really been the driving force behind, not an advertising uh, impetus. And to illustrate this, uh, I'd like to turn, perhaps controversially, to a theory I've borrowed from social psychology called self-determination theory. If you've read my article on uh, Magic the Gathering, this is old news to you. But the um, self-determination theory is, is a theory that was uh, experimentally determined in, in the year 2000, published in the year 2000. Um, and it holds that in almost all circumstances, human beings are inspired, motivated, uh, energetic, interested in situations where they feel uh, competent, autonomous, and related. Almost everything comes down to these three impetuses, which if properly satisfied, wind up making people feel invested and, and engaged in the, the activities that they are, they are engaging in. 
Um, if any one of these things is, is stymied or actively hampered, um, it, it is it no longer intrinsically motivating. So in the case of, you know, homework for, for courses, that's an extrinsic motivation where these factors are not there and you feel like you have to do it under threat of, I don't know, pain, expulsion, feeling bad about yourself. Um, and so I think the, the, uh, the suitability of this, this theory to games is, is fairly self-evident um, because we find, I think most of us here, games to be a pretty intrinsically motivating thing. We play because we find it fun, we find it engaging. For whatever reason, for whatever motivations that you have personally, um, I think that there are elements of these three that can be found in the way that most people play. And I'd specifically like to focus in this case on the, on the relatedness clause here. Um, so if social, if self-determination theory is, is to be considered at least somewhat accurate, then a very important part of what makes play interesting and fun is the knowledge that the things that you are doing in a game, be it only to the 12 people that you're playing Overwatch with or literally the entire Reddit community of, of several hundred thousand people, find the things that you are doing interesting and, and engaging. So that is part of the, the, the context of play, I think, that, that really um, explains why it is that, that storytelling systems have been taken up with such alacrity by, by the communities that engage with them. Um, and so this is a major plank in, in this system of concepts uh, that I've been dealing with for a little while uh, that kind of boil down to the metagame. And I'm borrowing my definitions from um, the work of uh, three scholars from Australia, Carter Gibbs and Harrop, who have written on the distinction between paragame, orthogame, and metagame. And without getting into too much detail, uh, they make these distinctions because um, we kind of tend to conflate games into this large conceptual mass that, that is difficult to tease out when we're trying to talk about different social elements of the game. Um, orthogame, uh, which is derived from uh, orthodox, the Greek word for, for straight upstanding, um, refers to the platonic ideal of games. So when we think about sitting down to play a game of chess, we don't tend to think about all of the all the social context that goes into it. We tend to think of this this almost ideal type of of rules and pieces and materials that uh, go into the play of chess. But of course, it's impossible to actually play an ortho game. You cannot play a game separate from a social context. So, ortho game is like an ideal type that we strive towards when playing games, but isn't doesn't actually describe play as we engage in it. Um, Paragame uh, describes other objectives that players might have while they are playing games. So. An ortho game would define the objective of a game to be just to complete the game, to emerge victorious, and that's it. But like I said, it's impossible to play a game without taking the social context into consideration. And so um, when playing a game of risk, you might be a little bit you know, hesitant to crush the five-year-old who's playing at the table with you. In fact, you might want to encourage them to win by purposely playing poorly because that might be a more rewarding experience for you than would be simply beating somebody that doesn't have a grasp of basic tactics. Um, and so anytime somebody's trying to play a game to achieve some kind of end state or outcome that isn't strictly defined by the ortho game, you are playing a para game. It's something that's parallel, sideways, adjacent to the game itself. And finally, there's the meta game, which describes the way that games interface with, with social reality uh, writ large. Um, and so the meta game is commonly used to describe the entire body of information that a player takes with them to the moment of play that informs how they think other people play or how a game is supposed to be played or what is prevalent or prominent or important uh, in a game at that at given moment in time. And, and the metagame is really what I want to focus in on um, in this case because I think that the storytelling impetus is, is not only enriches a metagame but is in fact critical to sustaining metagames which are important to making games continue to be popular over time. Um, and this can be seen a little bit in the work of Ko et al, uh, who wrote about the StarCraft II metagame. Um, and without getting into too much detail about it, they describe it as, as a construct of shared purpose um, uh, where players are basically sh developing information, new understandings, uh, sharing them, um, talking about them, discussing them, picking them apart. Uh, and that this, this activity was intrinsically rewarding to them. It was something that they found uh, fun in its own right, um, but also added to the larger context of play in tournament settings for, for games like uh, StarCraft II. So, sorry, I know that was a lot that I just threw at you, but uh, to break it down, this is, this is kind of, <laughs> I should copyright this, it's a terrible diagram, um, but it's, uh, this, is, this is the way that I see ortho games, metagames, and players uh, existing. And, and when I mentioned in the, the description for this talk that I see players as, as interfacing between uh, games and metagames, this is kind of what I'm, what I'm gesturing towards. Where players have a conception of the way that games are played and 
they almost derive information from the act of play and then through storytelling, through conveying moments of play, they wind up contributing to this larger body of knowledge which circulates about, about the way games are played and what people are doing with them, um, which then informs later uh, sessions of play. Um, and putting one player in there is a little bit you know, fallacious, so I did this instead of some total mess, and I'm sorry about that, but um, this, is, this is what's happening, is that, is that a ton of players are contributing to this large, shared, amorphous, contingent, contested conception of the way that games are played uh, through the act of play and through the act of telling other stories, uh, stories to other players about what they've done. Um, and I'd like to emphasize that I, I don't necessarily see this as a conscious decision. This isn't necessarily people who upload videos to YouTube, edited to convey a certain point. This can be as simple as, as just simply doing something a little bit stranger out of the ordinary in a given session of play, all the way up to, to having a play of the game that you upload to Reddit that rockets to the top of, of, of the all board and is seen by you know, several million people. Um, regardless of, the, of the, the scale of it, players tell stories about the way that they play and that informs how other players see the game and then play themselves and then back and forth in this, in this recursive relationship uh, between game and metagame. Um, and so uh, what, this, uh, what this has done, in my opinion, is it, it's made game communities um, uh, especially well suited to, to the modern media environments. And um, one of my favorite things, I, I spend a lot of time in the Overwatch Reddit because I am admittedly an addict of the game and, and full disclosure. Uh, one of my favorite things that happens on the regular is, um, is, is people from Reddit's all page where you know, everything from, from all of Reddit is displayed and the most popular things filter up to the top. Um, coming onto the Overwatch Reddit, or Hearthstone in this case, because it's up there as well, um, both of which are, are very specific game communities um, built around uh, a deep knowledge of a specific game, asking what the heck it is that they're, they're reading. These are often completely unintelligible things to people that are not already in the know about, about these games and specifically the metagames that they're, that they're responding to. Um, uh, so that not only speaks, I think, to, to the, the specificity of the knowledges that are involved in this kind of shared experience that's built and layered, um, but also the power that these things have to, to make communities cohere around these community practices. Um, and I, I can only speak anecdotally and also from you know, what I've seen on, on communities such as you know, Reddit and, and uh, Tumblr and, and uh, Twitter, but um, the fact that gaming Reddits are often placed in you know, the top 10 of, of all, especially in the era where you know, every time Trump says something ridiculous, it rockets to the top of, it, it's got stiff competition, is what I'm trying to say, and yet manages to, to float to the top of it because of how compelling, I argue, people find these practices. Um, and uh, I don't have any sound, so sorry, this is, this is uh, Jeff Kaplan, the, uh, the director of Overwatch, um, thanking uh, after winning an award, specifically the Reddit communities, the Twitter communities, the Twitch communities that were, uh, in, his, in his opinion, largely responsible for, for Overwatch's success. Um, and I just want to kind of leave off with uh, this thought that's, that's what I've taken from my thoughts on this thus far and I'm looking to look into further to do some more research on. And it's something I call uh, the state of exception um, uh, because one of the features of, of all the things that I just talked about is that people are not spending much of their time and attention looking at regular play. So if we think about this in Kuhnian terms, regular play is, is somewhat similar to regular science, normal science, where um, people go along acting within a paradigm and, and not necessarily stretching or, or altering the boundaries of that much, but every so often a certain discovery or piece of information comes along that, that institutes a, a gestalt shift, a paradigm shift. Um, and it's, it's moments like these that I think people tend to seek out and they look for, for what I've come to call states of exception um, that, that challenge or reconfigure or add something new to their conception of the way the game is played. Um, and uh, so this is why uh, you tend to find on, on, on communities that, that cohere around, around uh, the, the sharing of stories in games such as Overwatch, um, not so much stories told about people playing well or at a high level, but people playing unusually, doing something unorthodox. Um, the clip that I just played, I can play it again if anybody wants, um, is a play of the game that was generated when, when somebody punched a basketball into a, a hoop in the starting area for the net, completely uh, 
um, meaningless to the overall game context, managed to kill most of the enemy team and then died by falling down a hole. That's not usually how the game rewards gameplay, but it was very unusual and it, it won play of the game and very quickly rocketed and is one of the most popular posts that ever been posted to the, the Overwatch subreddit. Um, so this is, this is something I think, the, the, the concept of the state of exception is something that, that is touched on by a number of theories that have kind of tried to get at what it is that, that play does and how people interact with play uh, in a social setting. And um, I think most prominently, Mia Consalvo has talked about uh, her adaptation of, of uh, Bourdieu's cultural capital in the form of gaming capital. Um, and she talks in her book, Cheating, about how gaming capital is, is fundamentally different from, from cultural capital because it's, it's inherently mercurial. It's, it's, it, it runs away from itself almost as quickly as it can be defined. Um, because unlike, uh, say, in the classic example for Bourdieu, opera being a marker of, of high status or not, um, games and the capital that they, they carry are not so much defined in, in acquiring the same skills that other people have as much as pushing the envelope, being innovative, coming up with, with ways to use the game or emerge into directions that haven't been fully explored or, or uh, flushed out just yet. Um, and so this folds back on the co-definition of people coming up with information and knowledge and, and sharing it and, um, and also goes a long way towards explaining why it is, I think, these games that are designed to have compelling story-based metagames, um, such strong entries in, in the gaming space uh, today. And I rushed through it really quickly, so I hope uh, I didn't uh, keep you two, but uh, thank you, that's, uh, that's, that's what I got. All right, come at me, questions? Yes, please. Um, so the first thing I noticed is that all your examples of storytelling were incredibly limited, as in the game company has decided decided yes. what camera angles to use, what yep. they're going to show, what they're going to talk about, mm -hmm. using algorithms. Yep. Um, how do you think that uh, like affects the stories that people are telling them? Oh, I think I think it certainly uh, it it narrows them down by by a lot. This is this is not um, I'm not speaking to people coming up with their own stories and then and then trying to enact them in games. I, I'm 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 talking about almost you know slivers of difference when it comes to the way that people play we, people play games. Um, so this is not so much um, a radical opening of a possible story space as it is. Uh, trying to create an incredibly specialized bundle of knowledges about a way a game is meant to be played and then changing it by increments. That's, I think, what these systems are designed to do is, is to keep people very much within a paradigm of play that's well-defined and then, and then break it or iterate upon it by very, very small amounts. And for the people that are, that are well-invested in these communities, that is, I think, important and, and dramatic. But uh, from yeah, a wider perspective, no, it's extremely constrained. Yes? So, so you talk about states of exception yep. and dramatic moments, mm -hmm. and I just find myself wondering, do you think that there's a way to kind of group all that under the psychological concept of salience? Uh, I'm not familiar with the psychological concept of, of salience. Well, so. salience is just kind of, I mean, I don't know a lot about it either, but it, 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 it's just kind of like what is prominent in your perception, like okay. what, what sort of jumps out at you because some things will catch our attention and other things won't. Sure. And, and there's, there's a, I know that there's, there's got to be a lot of basic research back there on just, you know, just simple stuff like in general, like what catches our attention. And I, I'm kind of wondering now whether these, um, well, state of exception certainly is, well, this is an unusual thing, so it's much more likely to grab our attention. Mm -hmm. Anyway. That, that's the thought. Okay, all right. Uh, so no, sorry, I'm not, I'm not familiar with, uh, with salience theory. In fact, I, I have not read uh, at all extensively in, in psychology. I'm a bit of a neophyte in that respect. Um, uh, sorry, pardon me. Uh, the reason I've really honed in on um, um, self-determination theory, which is I think kind of what the, the contrast we're trying to make there is, um, is that it, it incorporates this, this notion that things are going to be meaningful to other people that, that are playing the game, um, but also that you're coming up with something that is, that is interesting and different and kind of putting your own, your own stamp on, on things in the relatedness clause. So I can see how the two might be, if not synonymous, at least related, in, uh, salience and, and those two elements of, of self-determination theory, but uh, without reading the, the, the stuff on, on salience, I, I couldn't really tell you. But it does sound like a good fit. Well, I'm just kind of wondering about that because, uh, because if if there was, you know, some way to relate the concepts, then, you know, we might actually know a lot 
more about this than, than we think. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So you talked about uh, Bartle's socializer yep. and relatedness, which mm -hmm. are very similar yep. to you know, how you perceive the people around you and how you think they look at you. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing you didn't talk about is that the stories that people tell to their teammates over chat during the game mm -hmm. and after the game. Yes. Um, how do you think those contribute to the medicine? Uh, I think... Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, of course, it depends on, on the medium. Um, but uh, yes, those are incredibly important parts of, of storytelling. The distinction I was trying to draw is that is that, that form of socialization, talking to your friends uh, while you're playing on, on uh, yeah, TeamSpeak or, or what have you, um, is kind of accounted for in, in Bartle's typology. Uh, you know, when you're actually pressing the push to talk button and speaking to people, you've taken a, a momentary break from play, even though those two are, are inextricably wound up together in terms of team-based communication, stra strategizing, etc. Um, more what I was trying to do with this talk is, is show that there's this continuum that was established by, by Bartle where play is on one end and socializing is on the other, and they do mix a little bit, but the more you move towards one side, the further you move away from the other. Uh, and what I was trying to get at is that, is that um, the simple act of, of play and engaging in, in this, this kind of activity is in, in itself a, a socially weighted um, activity. You, you are partially motivated, I would argue, uh, to do the things you do in games because you know that they are interesting and meaningful to other people that are observing them. And so that's, that's the distinction I'm trying to draw is that, yes, all the things that Bartle has talked about certainly fit within that conception that I'm trying to establish, but so does the act of play itself. Okay. I, I would say so, yes. Um, uh, I think that Blizzard, um, I don't think that they've, they've come up with anything you know, intrinsically new with the, the play of the game system. It's an iteration on a system that, that has been developing for a very long time. Um, uh, I think that yes, in part, uh, the reason why they chose the algorithmic route and not the other route is that there's no way for players to, to game that in the same way, where uh, you see plenty of, to, to expand on what uh, Sean was talking about, um, you see in the Call of Duty uh, YouTube videos several videos of people knowing that the next kill is going to be the, the last one and so doing absolutely ridiculous things or, or actively subverting what's supposed to be an interesting moment. Um, and Blizzard might have been trying to get around that uh, in a certain respect. but. Uh, I think you also touched on something else that I think I, I find really interesting but didn't include in this talk is, is, is how this branches off into things that are, are more performative and more about the performative moment. Um, and so many of the practices that I'm talking about I think extend to speed running communities, uh, communities that are trying to crack or hack or otherwise uh, subvert the rules of the game and they, they wind up developing their own metagames. I, I would consider speedrunning, for instance to be a metagame practice which is comprised of bodies of knowledge that have been built up about, about how the game works and how to subvert that and it's the same thing where states of exception wind up taking on a, an incredible role in changing the way people think about this uh, and inspiring new approaches to say speedrunning a game. So that's kind of my response. Sorry I didn't give a yes or no. <laughs> Yes. I have lots of stuff, so we can probably talk later. Okay. Um, could you say all of these same things without referring to the word storytelling? Yeah, probably. So, I, I like. I'm wondering if storytelling is just a red herring, because when you're saying storytelling, you're meaning something very, very specific and speaking to a, a, a general audience, but. Here, I think that your examples are more about performance. Yes. Right? Yep. And establishing reputation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if maybe it's something closer to like having a selfie. <laughs> actually, I didn't think about that. That's, uh, yeah, actually, now that you say that, that's a, that's a really good parallel. Yes. Um, so, uh, my response to that, if I may, is that is that I, I'm trying to speak less about the kind of the player agency involving storytelling. So you know, people don't aren't setting out as much in my conception with the intention of sell, telling stories, but rather that these 12 second clips do tell stories intrinsically, and that's kind of how things are taken up in in the community. But I kind of almost like the selfie uh, allegory better. Because Sorry. Selfies are stories. <laughs> selfies are stories, but they're not stories in the same way. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Having that visibility that you're presenting yep. being sort of a status marker or mm -hmm. reputation or something of like, hey, look at me, I did something really, really cool. And all and this like comes up to that you answered a question about like, well, what about Chuck and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like those are two very different things. Like the types of things that you're talking about are more about establishing reputation mm -hmm. in some sense. Yep. In many cases, or, yes. Or looking at skills. 
also sort of, sort of, you said that nobody really took up Bartle's player types. Oh, no, no, they, I, I, I think I said it, they did, or? Okay. I, I'm pretty sure they, they certainly did. But you mean the socialization thing. And I'm wondering if you're taking a different reading of Bartle than I am. Okay. In the argument that socialization is different from play, mm -hmm. further away from play. Okay. And I'm wondering if you're focused on the Carter Gibbs sort of thing about ortho game, the okay. right way to play a game, is part of the problem. Okay. And that you're mixing up play Right, which is sort of um, free movement between the construct of rules of the game mm -hmm. at, or any sort of rigid structure yep. if you're going from Salem and Zimmerman and game, yep. right, where you have these rules and you're trying to achieve a predetermined goal uh, following constraints. Yes. Um, and so this is sort of where I think that maybe there's a little bit of slippage Okay, sure. Happening. All right. Um, so yes, I, I'm sure it's it's very possible that you and I have interpreted uh, Bartle uh, differently. But um, I, I could pull up the quotes if if uh, if you give me a moment. Um, but I reread uh, the Bartle's you know foundational types of players, the 1996 article that he writes, um, and uh, I, I remembered a section that uh, where he starts to talk about like player hybrids and things that kind of occur when when the the types begin to mix. Um, because in his kind of pure description of, of socializers, he actually does specifically delineate that the game is, is a secondary or almost not at all a concern for the people that are there to socialize. It just so happens to be it's kind of, structure. yeah, yeah, it's a structure that allows them to, people are there, they know people are there, certain people happen to be there, they're happy to go to meet those people, but but the game is, is yeah, kind of of, of no consequence. Um, and unfortunately, like, if if his mixing of the of the archetypes uh, wound up accounting for for the fact that I don't think that there's as rigid a separation as as the ideal type of socializer would would imply, uh, I would be satisfied. But uh, upon rereading it, he he doesn't. It it it, it persists even as he begins to try and account for the other other player types mixing together, where doing one necessarily pr precludes the other. Sorry, backing up a little bit. Uh, one of the more recent brown bag talks we had was uh, by Dr. David Nieborg. Um, I don't know if anybody was in attendance. Jen, you certainly were. Um, and uh, uh, he discussed at length um, the work uh, that he'd kind of done in, in conversation with uh, uh, Jose Van 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 De, Van Dyke Van Dyke. I'm not sure how to say the last name. V Jose. Uh, go for that. Um, and uh, he talked about uh, the importance of, of what he termed network effects in, uh, in the, the modern gaming context, where effectively we're, we're in a, a media environment now where, where games that are capable of being fecund in terms of the social tension they can generate wind up being self-reinforcing. Self um, they wind up uh, dominating the, the attention space of the people that are, that are interested in, in a certain type of media or a certain type of game. Um, uh, and I, I really do think that, that metagames are kind of implicit in that, where, where uh, if something was static and stale and, and, and didn't change on, a, on kind of a perpetual basis, um, the, the ability of the network effects to, to engender that kind of sustained uh, uh, market dominance would, would disappear very rapidly. Um, and uh, so the, the, the game companies, I think, are very, very carefully trying to design these systems so that they do wind up kind of presenting a curated space within which they're not sure what's going to happen in that space, but the space is still constrained, and they're trying to give a certain impression of the game that is morphing and in flux uh, to try and bolster the network effects they can Probably take advantage of. Yeah, yeah, in a way. Like, I think the network effects sort of thing is, is a useful way to start thinking about it because you're sort of looking at snippets of replayability, right? and bragging and, and like this sort of reputation sort of stuff which mm -hmm. like I'm just going to encapsulate into selfies. Sure, sure. You're basically looking at selfies and these selfies <laughs> sort of become... Oh no, I've turned into bogos. But, uh, but no. I, don't, I don't mean like in that yeah, way. I yeah, just yeah, mean yeah. in the context of this sort of discussion. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at selfies, these selfies get replayed in different communities and rewatched. If you're a sociologist, you would say, well, this is about sort of a community coming together and having a discussion about the norms of play. Mm -hmm. like what constitutes good play? Is this cheating? Is this not? Mm -hmm. Is this like something that we should celebrate? Is this skillful? Do we accept it or not? And sort of this negotiation. Mm -hmm. And so this discussion about norms that's centered on the selfie moment, the replay moment, is something that contributes to the larger metagame. Absolutely, right? yes. And so game companies are, are setting up sort of these moments of discussing and, and conflicting over norms of yeah. Or replayability. Yep. Um, 
or making players visible in this way yes. via reputation and, and sort of things like that and resharing. Yep. Which is sort of their way of keeping a game alive yes. much longer. Yes. And so for me, I would say, like, and that this discussion, this is actually what builds a community of play when you actually don't have a physical community. If you're thinking about traditional gameplay where you're sitting together at a table mm -hmm. and we have a discussion about our shitty day at work or whatever, or we're eating together. Or, or even there's a rules conflict, like, you know, there's, right. yeah, any right. of those we moments. Have these negotiations yep. and we have a community of play just because we're just human beings. But when then you move online and you have that sort of distance, this mm -hmm. disembodied interaction, you don't have the same affordances for easily building yes. a community of play. Yep. So then you create these selfies mm -hmm. as a mode for getting people to argue yep. about what the norms of our community yeah. are, yeah. what the rules are for whether this is good or not, or mm -hmm. what do we think of this person, are they just a show off or whatever, and yep. then that sort of discussion is what actually creates a community bond, right? Because yep. as soon as people agree what the norms are, and, and like, this is awesome, let's reshare it, and, and like, let's talk about it, yeah. then that creates a community in these online spaces. Yes. What's really interesting, too, is that while they're creating this community, like, originally, like, like play the game, and you're like, oh, I'm the player, I did this cool thing, and you upload it, it's attached to you as a player, but then this gets reshared a million times, copied to Imgur, turned to a gift, and suddenly it's not about the player anymore. It's about like insert name of character you were playing here. So the game company wins. Mm -hmm. It's markability for that character who did this cool thing. Yep. Rather than it is for the player anymore. Absolutely. Well, it might have been at the beginning. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, this is at, at once, I think, um, a major point where there's critical work to be done to kind of, you know, explode that that particular practice. But at the same time, uh, it is something that that does invigorate the the modern context of play. And so it's it's tough to be fully condemnatory and or fully commended uh, or fully commended. Um, simply because people are taking it up and using it their own way. But in the end, yeah, the company still does win. Okay, well, thanks everybody for, for listening. I uh, appreciate it. And um, yeah, if any other questions come up later, feel free to, for, to get at me.